Well, thank you very much uh, for staying with us here on SA Today. The Moral Regeneration Movement, along with the uh, CRL Rights Commission, are holding a virtual engagement to discuss the role of law in nation building. Uh, let's take you there and listen in on uh, that engagement. They said that we don't want to have a child, and that is it. Why? It's because of what they see in the society, how the society has become a space where they are no longer safe. But once we begin to assure them that there are so many things that can be done, how to handle relationship and tell the boys how to appreciate women, then they will begin to have a second thought. And when they have their own ch children, they can pass on those values. So it's a long-term thing, but individuals themselves cannot just do it. The government must take the initiative. And that is why I think the Department of Family and Social Relations is extremely crucial because that department will be saddled with the primary responsibility of developing a new family structure where values and morals can be used as a means of building the society, starting from the family as the primary agent of socialization. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Alex. Thanks for the detailed answer. Uh, before I go to Advocate Tembeka, Tem Advocate, I just want you to perhaps look at the group check. There's some questions there that you need to answer. And then I want to ask uh, Prof Omosoma to probably uh, just give a comment. He, he had yeah, thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director. Um, for the um, for the um, I just want to check what you decipher from Mandela's life history and commitment. Whether in it you don't see what I would want to call legal activism. Because it's, no, it's not so much about practicing law, it's about living it. It's about making sure that law becomes an instrument of defense that society can use. Secondly, in your view, the, the cost of justice or access to justice South Africa, does it uh, justify the, the, the legacy of um, uh, President Mandela in terms of his vision of society, where inclusivity and participation, at least at a lower level, was an important criteria? That's number one for him. Um, number two, um, it goes to um, um, the second speaker, uh, Larry. I wanted to check, Larry. We have universities, we have uh, schools, and the schools and universities are supposed to be the place where values are developed imbued in young people have we missed the point since 1994 that we have created and and um, produced in our institutions people who have understood only one way of solving problems namely violence um conflict i mean uh, 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 feuds and things like that and as a religious scholar how do you account the fact that even the religion today uses violence as a means of solving problems? And that, for me, it's a critical issue. We need to, to, to deal with these things because why I'm raising this thing? It's one thing to extol virtues, values. It's another to come up with a constructive proposal. How do we make sure that we build a nation different from the one that we inherited in the past. I think this should be the focus of this uh, conversation. We know what values are. We know what uh, justice is. But knowing justice and living justice are two different things. We may have been taught, uh, for example, uh, about uh, social cohesion because it's one way of how people saw it. But if this is not working for us, what will work for us? Because we're, there, we're at the crossroads today. What will work for South Africa? What is the vision of this nation? What should South Africa become? And that's, for me, a critical question to be asked. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Prof. Musoma. Uh, advocate, before you respond, I just want to draw Prof. Maluleke to uh, attention to a question in the chat line. Perhaps you can look at that. So after uh, advocate answers, I will then come back to Dr. Kaufman. You can then respond and then come to Prof. Maluleke at the end. Uh, advocate, uh, Oh, thank you. you. <laughs> there you um, are. Here we are. Yes, thank you. I, 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 I think what I will do, um, I'll probably answer three themes uh, rather than trying to, to respond to uh, individuals. I mean, there's a fascinating point made. I think it's it's, it's uh, Professor Musoma or Mr. Musoma, which is the, the, the question of what to do about Mandela's legacy. And he splits the question into two. So there's the, the legacy of Mandela, the legal activist, and then there is also the, the legacy of uh, Mandela, the president, in other words, the constitutional legacies. I mean, both of those are highly contested legacies uh, of, of Mandela. Let me start with, with, with legal activism. So Mandela bega- begins uh, his, his, his legal training, like many of us do, you know, drawn into the the uh, profession by various interests and not at the start at the stage he began law not yet clear whether or not he wanted to use law as an instrument of 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 justice uh, but attracted to it by various other trappings it is only when he is inside uh, the legal system that it becomes almost inevitable that uh, if you want to practice law as a black man in the 1950s, it is almost inevitable that you will be involved in some uh, uh, political activity or, 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 or the other. And this is a kind of conversation that is ongoing between him and, uh, and Oliver Tambo about what, in fact, will they do with their training as lawyers? Uh, how are they going to use the, the, the law firm. And the law firm is converted not a, as, a, as a result of a deliberate design, but the law firm is ultimately co- converted by a push from below. It's the, it's the, it's the reality, as, as Oliver Tambo pointed out in, in his biography, being black essentially was a criminal act in South Africa in the 1950s. It's, it's the state of blackness was a state of criminality because the apartheid laws stretched from birth to death you were always a crime one way or the other. If you were born in the wrong place, that was a crime. If you happened to step on the wrong street, that was a crime. If you happened to go into the wrong toilet, that was a crime. A wrong school, a crime. A wrong university, a crime. So that entire livelihood, if you were a criminal lawyer in the 1950s, it was almost inevitable that you will be involved in in, in politics, because the state of blackness was a state of criminality, and that is Oliver Tambo's uh, uh, observation. So the activism is almost imposed on Mandela. It is an a- activism that he cannot uh, uh, run away from. It is inside the law firm, and it is also at home. But Mandela is not a narrow um, a legal activist. I am a narrow legal activist because I'm an, a, a legal activist, but I am not involved in politics as such. I mean, in politics with a big P. Mandela is also not a narrow activist. At a certain point in time, he comes to the recognition that law on its own will not bring liberation. It will not dismantle apartheid. Apartheid requires a different approach, a different strategy. It requires him to remove the velvet glove so that we can all see the iron fist. That is not to abandon the law uh, for Mandela, but it is to use the law in a complementary way. Because when arrested, remember the strategy that Sobuka used that they will not be asking for bail. But when Mandela is arrested, he knows that in order to soften the effect of a punishment, he needs to assemble a team of lawyers. So even though he has decided that he will engage in armed struggle, even that armed struggle itself is restricted in relation to its targets. It's not the kind of an armed struggle that will be destroying everything and anything in its wake, but it will be a targeted armed struggle in order to protect deaths against civilians. And even when the MK is operating outside in the 60s and in the 70s, one of the big topics uh, in MK is how to sustain the Bill of Rights in a military context. And that's when Oliver Tambo says, well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, that we must also apply the Geneva Convention in relation to prisoners of war. So at no point does Mandela abandon 
the belief in the essence of the rule of law and the belief in the essence of the Bill of Rights, even after he has decided that I am now removing the velvet glove. So I see Mandela as a much more ex in, in a much more expansive uh, understanding of, of of the in the 60s. I mean, when it was really really hard that uh, he was always struggling with balancing um, the fight against apartheid in its raw form, as well as ensuring that there is some sort of a semblance of law. And this is probably why he did not find a difficulty. All right. Uh, this conversation is uh, also available uh, online. It is uh, the role of law in nation building, uh, the moral regeneration movement, along with the CRRL Rights Commission, uh, holding that uh, virtual uh, engagement to discuss uh, the role of law in nation building. Of course, you heard there from Advocate Tembe Ngai Tobi, and uh, the question posed to him was, of course, about uh, Mandela's legacy, and he's chosen to really uh, kind of divide it into two, the legacy of uh, Mandela in his legal, as a legal activist, as well as his constitutional legacy as uh, our first democratic uh, president. So quite an interesting conversation taking place there, which you can certainly uh, find online. All right, let's take a look. At